Preface of Love Romances of the Aristocracy Love Romances of the Aristocracy by Thornton Hall Preface My object in writing this book has been to present as many phases as possible of the strangely romantic story of the British peerage, so that those who have not the time or facilities for exploring the library of books over which these stories are scattered may be able, within the compass of a single volume, to review the panorama of our aristocracy, with its tragedy and comedy, its romance and pathos, its foibles and its follies, in a few hours of what I sincerely hope will prove agreeable reading, if my book gives to any reader a fraction of the pleasure I have derived from its writing, I shall be more than rewarded for a labor which has been to me a delight. Thornton Hall As love plays a prominent part in at least twenty of these stones, and in only really absent from one or two of them, I venture to hope that my good friends, the reviewers, who have been so kind to my previous books, will not find fault with my title, which more accurately than any other I can think of, describes the nature and scope of my book. T.H. End of Preface Recording by Sarah Hale Chapter 1 of Love Romances of the Aristocracy Love Romances of the Aristocracy by Thornton Hall Chapter 1 A Princess of Prudes among the many fair and frail women who fed the flames of the merry monarch's passion from the first day of his restoration to that last day but one short week before his death when evelyn saw him quote, sitting and toying with his concubines there was it is said only one of them all who really captured his royal and wayward heart that loveliest simplest and most designing of prudes La Belle Stuart. When Barbara Villiers was enslaving Charles by her opulent charms, the queen of his many mistresses, Frances Stuart was growing to beautiful girlhood, an exile at the French court with no dream or care of her future conquest of a king. Her father, a son of Lord Blantyre, had carried his death-dealing sword through many a fight for the first Charles, a distant kinsman of his own, and when the Stuart son set in blood, had made good his escape to the friendly shores of France, where he had found a fresh field for his valor. Meanwhile, his daughter was happy in the charge of the widowed Queen Henrietta Maria, who, although, as Cardinal de Retz tells us, she frequently lacked a faggot to leave her bread in the Louvre, and even a crust to stay the pains of hunger, proved a tender foster mother to brave Walter Stewart's child, and watched her growth to beauty with a mother's pride. Even before she emerged from short frocks, Frances Stewart had established herself as the pet par excellence of the court of France. With Anne of Austria, the little Scottish maiden was a prime favorite, Every gallant, from Monsieur to the rakish Comte de Guise, loved to romp with her and to join in her peals of childish laughter. And the king himself, Louis the Fourteenth, stole many a kiss and was proud to be called her big sweetheart. So devoted was his majesty to la belle Ecossaise that when her mother talked of taking her away to England, he begged that she would not remove so fair an ornament from his court, and vowed that he would provide the child with a splendid dower and a noble husband if she would but allow her to remain. But Madam Stuart had other designs for her pretty daughter, and when Henrietta Maria took boat to England to shine again at the court of Whitehall under her son's reign, Frances Stuart joined her retinue and found herself transported from the schoolroom to the most brilliant and dangerous court in Europe. When this transformation came in her life, Walter Stuart's daughter was just blossoming into as sweet and fragrant a flower as ever bloomed in woman's guise. Fair and graceful as a lily, with luxuriant brown hair, eyes of violet and a proud dainty little head she had a figure which although yet not fully formed 
was faultless in its modeling and its exquisite grace. And these physical charms were allied to an unspoiled freshness, which combined the artless fascinations of the child with the allurements of the woman. Such was Frances Stuart when she made her appearance at the court of Charles II, as maid of honor to his queen, Catherine. And one can scarcely wonder that even among the most beautiful women in England, the French Mademoiselle, as she was called, was hailed as a new revelation of female fascination, especially as she brought with her the bubbling gaiety and passionate zest of life of the land of her exile. To the merry monarch's senses, sated with riper beauties and more stolid charms, this unspoiled child of nature was as a wild rose compared with the exotic hothouse flowers. She was, he vowed, so dainty, so fresh, so fragrant, that none but the sourest of anchorites could resist her, and he was no anchorite, as the world knew well. Almost at sight of her he fell madly in love with her, and brought to bear on her the battery of all his fascinations. Was ever maid placed on the threshold of life in so dangerous a predicament? For the king, who was her first lover, was also one of the most captivating men in England, a past master in the conquest of woman. But in response to all his advances, his honeyed words and oglings, the Stuart maid only laughed a merry, childish laugh. She would romp with him, as she had done with the gallants at the French court. To her, he was only another big playfellow to tease and play with. She knew nothing of love, and did not wish to know more. He might kiss her. Vraiment, why not? And that Charles made abundant use of this concession, we know. For we are told that he would kiss her for half an hour at a time, caring little who looked on. And all her other Whitehall lovers, a legion of them, from the Duke of Buckingham to the youngest page at court, she treated in precisely the same way. Was it innocence or artfulness, this assumption of childish prudery? She was a child, says Count Hamilton, in all respects save playing with dolls, a child who refused to grow into a woman, and yet one shrewdly suspects that behind her childishness was a motive deeper than is usually associated with so much simplicity. She infected the whole court with her exuberant youthfulness, Basset tables and boudoir intrigues were alike deserted to enjoy the new era of nursery games which she inaugurated. Jaded gallants and sedate ladies of the bedchamber mingled their shrieks of laughter in blind man's bluff and hunt the slipper with the Stuart maid as lady of misrule and arch spirit of jollity. Pepys was shocked, or affected to be, one day by seeing all the great and fair ones of the court squatting on the floor in the Whitehall gallery, playing at, I love my love with an A because he is amorous, I hate him with a B because he is boring, and so on, and no doubt rocking with glee at some sally of wit, for, Pepys says, some of them were very witty. The little madcap even carried her games and toys into the sacred environment of the audience chamber. Seated on the floor, innocently exposing the prettiest pair of ankles in England, and surrounded by her big playfellows, she would challenge them to a competition in castle building with cards. And when her carefully reared edifice toppled to the ground, she would break into a silvery peal of laughter and clap her hands for the king to come and help her to rebuild it. For no less distinguished assistant would she allow to touch her cards. And Charles never failed to respond to the summons, though he were hobnobbing with chancellor or archbishop and would be sent away happy with a kiss for his pains. No wonder poor Pepys was horrified at such unseemly goings-on. And equally small wonder that the king's mistresses and the great ladies of the court cast many a jealous and vindictive glance on the child, who had power to lure away their slaves to her nursery shrine. The Duke of Buckingham himself 
was prouder to be her favorite playfellow than all of his conquests in the field of love. He wrote songs and sang them for her pleasure. He kept her in a ripple of laughter for hours together by his stories and clever mimicry, and rushed to her side whenever she summoned him to build card castles or to join in a romp, until what was play to the child began to prove a serious matter to the man of the world. He found that, while he was building castles or chasing the elusive fairy blindfolded, she had stolen his heart away. But when he ventured to tell his love to her, she boxed his ears and told him to run away and not be so naughty again. Was there ever so tantalizing and inscrutable a maid? As she had treated the king and his chief favorite, she treated all her other playfellows. The Earl of Arlington, a grave, dignified lord of the bedchamber, so far unbended as to make love to the little witch, who stood so well in the favor of his sovereign, and never did man exert himself more to win the favor of a maid. Having provided himself, says Hamilton, with a great number of maxims and some historical anecdotes, he obtained an audience of Miss Stuart in order to display them, at the same time offering her his most humble services in the situation to which it had pleased God and her virtue to raise her. But he was only in the preface of his speech when he reminded her so ludicrously of Buckingham's mimicry of him that she burst into a peal of laughter in his very face and rushed stifling from the room. Thus ignominiously was sounded the death knell of Arlington's hopes. George Hamilton, one of the most handsome and fascinating men in England, fared better, but retired from the pursuit of so seductive and tantalizing a maid. Still, Hamilton was the most congenial playfellow of them all. He was a madcap like herself, always ripe for fun and frolic, and for a time she reveled in his comradeship. He first won her heart in the following fashion. One day, old Lord Carlingford, was delighting and convulsing her by placing a lighted candle in his mouth and hobbling to and fro thus illuminated. I can do better than that, exclaimed the irrepressible Hamilton. Give me two candles. The candles were produced. Hamilton lit them and thrust the pair into his capacious mouth and minced three times round the room before they were extinguished, while La Belle Stuart paraded after him, clapping her hands and laughing in her glee. Such a feat was an efficient passport to her favor. Rollicking George was at once installed as a playmate-in-chief to the spoiled child, and was privileged with a greater intimacy than any of her other favorites had ever enjoyed. Since the court has been in the country, he confessed, I have had a hundred opportunities of seeing her. You know that the decibel of the bath is a great convenience for those ladies who, strictly adhering to their rules of decorum, are yet desirous to display all their charms and attractions. Miss Stewart is so fully acquainted with the advantages she possesses over all other women that it is hardly possible to praise any lady at court for a well-turned arm and a fine leg, but she is ever ready to dispute the point by demonstration. After all, a man must be very insensible to remain unconcerned and unmoved on such happy occasions. It is conceivable that Hamilton, stimulated by such, no doubt, artless encouragement as he seems to have enjoyed, might have made a conquest where so many had failed, had not his future brother-in-law, Graymont, taken him seriously to task and warned him of the grave danger of flirting with the lady on whom the king had set eyes of love, and persuaded him, at the eleventh hour, to beat a dignified retreat. Pepys draws a pretty picture of Miss Stuart at this time, as he saw her riding among the ladies of honor with the queen in the park. I followed them, he says, up into Whitehall and into the queen's presence, where all the ladies walked, talking and fiddling with their hats and feathers, and changing and trying one another's by one another's heads and laughing. But above all, 
Miss Stewart in this dress, with her hat cocked in a red plume, with her sweet eyes, little Roman nose, and excellent tie, is now the greatest beauty I ever saw, I think, in my life. And if ever woman can do exceed my Lady Castlemaine, at least in this dress, nor do I wonder if the king's changes, which I verily believe is the reason of his coldness to my Lady Castlemaine. How many hearts Frances Stuart toyed with and broke in these days of her girlish beauty and irresponsibility will never be known, but we know that at least one hopeless wooer committed suicide, and another, Francis Digby, Lord Bristol's handsome son, after years of unrequited idolatry, in his despair rushed away to seek and find death in the Dutch war. And it was not only over men that Frances Stuart cast the spell of her witchery. One of her earliest and most ardent admirers was none other than my Lady Castlemate herself, who alone claimed to hold her sovereign's heart. So secure she thought herself of her supremacy that she not only took the French beauty into favor, but actually encouraged Charles in his pursuit of her, probably little realizing how dangerous a rival she was taking to her bosom. It is said that this was but an artifice to divert Charles's attention from an intrigue that she was carrying on with that rakish beau Henry German. But, whatever the cause... There is no doubt that for a time she lost no opportunity of throwing her royal lover and the fair Stuart together. She even looked on smilingly at a mock marriage at one of her own entertainments between the pair, quote, with ring and all other ceremonies of church service and ribbons, and a sack posset in bed, and fleeing the stocking, evincing neither anger nor jealousy, but entering into the diversion with great spirit. And not only did she thus trifle with fire, for some months she rarely saw the king but in Miss Stuart's presence. The king, to quote Hamilton again, who seldom neglected to visit the countess before she rose, seldom failed likewise to find Miss Stuart with her. The most indifferent objects have charms in a new attachment. However, the countess was not jealous of this rival's appearing with her in such a situation, being confident that whenever she thought fit, she could triumph over all the advantages which these opportunities could afford Miss Stuart. As a matter of fact, Charles's maîtresse un titre regarded the mademoiselle as nothing more dangerous than a pretty, winsome child. She is a lovely little thing, she once said patronizingly, but she is only a spoiled child, fonder of her toys and games than of the finest lover in the world. But she was not long left in this unsuspicious paradise. There was soon no doubt that the child had made a conquest of the king, and that she, the mother of his children, no longer held the throne of his heart. Her first rude disillusionment came when Charles was presented by Graymont with the most elegant and magnificent carriage, called a calash, that had ever been seen. The queen herself and Lady Castlemaine each decided that she and no other should be the first to take an airing in Hyde Park in this gorgeous vehicle, which was sure to create an unparalleled sensation, and each exerted her utmost arts and eloquence to secure this concession from the king. Miss Stuart, however, had the same wish and requested to have the calash on the same occasion. The queen retired in disdain from such a conquest, while the king was driven to distraction between the conjoling and threats of the two rival beauties. It was Miss Stuart, however, who won the day, to Lady Castlemaine's unrestrained rage and disgust. The child had scored the first point in a duel, the prize of which was the king's favor. According to Hamilton, this victory was believed to have cost the prude her virtue. But Miss Stuart had proved again and again that she was no such compliant maid. The only passport to her favors 
though a king sought them, was a wedding ring, and amid all the temptations of a dissolute court, where virtue was as hard to seek as a needle in a bundle of hay, she adhered to this high resolve. Probably no maid ever found her way with such a sure step through the iniquitous mazes of Charles the Second's court to an honorable marriage as La Belle Stuart, though at one time she so despaired of realizing her ambition to be a duchess that she declared she was ready to marry any gentleman of fifteen hundred a year that would have her in honor and never perhaps have the designs of a dissolute king been so cleverly and consistently baffled charles made no concealment of his passion for the beautiful maid of honor and the more coldly she treated his advances the more marked and ardent was his pursuit mr pierce tells me pepys writes that my lady castlemaine is not at all set by by the king but that he do dote upon mrs stuart only and that to the leaving of all business in the world and to the open sliding of the queen that he values not who sees him or stands by while he dallies with her openly and then privately in her chamber below while the very sentries observe him going in and out and that so commonly that the duke or any of the nobles when they would ask where the king is they will ordinarily say is the king above or below meaning with mrs stuart that the king do not openly disown my lady castlemaine but that she comes to court such was the spell which this enchantress cast over the king nor were her conquests by any means confined to the circle of the court in which she moved a splendid but unassailable queen for every man who came within the magic of her presence seems to have lost both head and heart one of the most infatuated of all her victims was philippe rotier the youngest brother of the famous medalists whom charles had invited to england and whose first commission was to design a medal in celebration of the peace of breda for the purposes of this medal miss stuart was asked by the king to pose as britannia and so captivated was philippe rotier to whom she gave sittings by the exquisite perfection and grace of her figure and so entranced by her beauty that he fell madly in love with her and narrowly escaped the loss of reason as well as of his heart since that day the figure of britannia has appeared on millions of coins and medals to perpetuate through the centuries the faultless form of the woman who drove artist as well as king to the verge of despair by her beauty and her inaccessible prudery it was destined however that a prize which had so long eluded the handsomest gallants of england should fall at last to one of the most insignificant of all charles's courtiers a man who had neither good looks intellect nor character to commend him to a lady's favour such a gilded nonentity was charles stuart duke of richmond and of lennox who having buried two wives now began to cast envious eyes on the maid of honor whom his sovereign could not win small in stature deformed in figure a character of a man his grace of richmond was the last degenerate scion of the stuarts of richmond d'aubigny a man of depraved tastes and besotted brain the butt and the clown of charles's court that this middle-aged buffoon should aspire to the hand of the loveliest and most elusive woman in england was only less amazing than that she should smile on his suit the court was struck with consternation and convulsed with laughter nothing so utterly astonishing and so ludicrous had come within its experience but there could be no doubt about it la belle stuart who had so long resisted the king and given the cold shoulder to such gallants as the duke of buckingham and lord arlington was not only smiling on her ill-favoured suitor she was actually giving him midnight assignations in her own apartments and risking for a clown the reputation a king had been so powerless to sully here at last 
was a fine weapon placed in the hands of the outraged and vindictive Castlemaine. Here was a splendid opportunity of paying off old scores, of showing to her royal lover the kind of woman for whom he had supplanted her, and of reinstating herself in his good graces. One night, as he returned in an evil temper from a fruitless attempt to visit Miss Stewart's apartments, from which he had been sent away on some frivolous pretext, he was accosted by my lady Castlemaine, who, with ill-concealed triumph, told him that at the moment La Belle Stuart turned him away from her door, she was actually dallying with his new and contemptible rival, the Duke of Richmond, at the other side of it. Charles was incredulous, furious at the suggestion. "'Come with me,' Lady Castlemaine answered, "'and I will prove that I am telling you the simple truth.' and taking his hand she led him exultantly down the gallery from his apartments to the threshold of Miss Stewart's door, where, with a sweeping curtsy and an invitation to enter, she left him. On throwing open the door, to quote Hamilton, the king, quote, found Miss Stewart in bed, but far from being asleep. The Duke of Richmond was seated at her pillow, and in all probability was less inclined to sleep than herself. The king, who of all men was usually one of the most mild and gentle, testified his resentment to the Duke of Richmond in such terms as he had never used before. The Duke was speechless and almost petrified. He saw his master and king justly irritated. The first transports which rage inspires on such occasions are dangerous. Miss Stewart's window was very convenient for a sudden revenge, and the Thames flowing close beneath it. He cast his eyes upon it, and seeing those of the king more incensed and fired with indignation than he thought his nature capable of, he made a profound bow, and retired without replying a single word to the vast torrent of threats and menaces that were poured upon him. But if the duke proved thus a poltroon, Miss Stewart showed a very different medal. She was furious at the indignity of the king's intrusion on her privacy, and proceeded to read him such a lecture as his royal ears had never listened to. She was no slave, she said, with flashing eyes, to be treated in such a manner, not to be allowed to receive visits from a man of the Duke of Richmond's rank, who came with honorable intentions. She was perfectly free to dispose of her hand as she thought proper, and if she could not do it in England, there was no power on earth that could hinder her from going over to France, and throwing herself into a convent to enjoy that tranquility that was denied her in his court. And the enraged beauty wound up her lecture by pointing imperiously to the door and bidding the king be gone, to leave her in repose at least for the remainder of the night. Charles went away baffled and cowed, but with a fierce rage in his heart. He had been defied, browbeaten, insulted by the woman for whom he would have almost bartered his crown, and he vowed that he would be revenged. On the following morning, Miss Stewart, her anger now cooled, and awake to the enormity of her offense against Charles, sought an audience with Queen Catherine, to whom she told the whole story begging her to appease the king and to induce him to allow her to retire to a convent. So affecting was this interview that we are told the queen and the maid of honor mingled their tears together, and Catherine promised to do her the utmost to bring about a reconciliation. One final attempt Charles made to capture the prize before it was lost to him forever. He offered to dismiss all his mistresses, from the Castlemaine herself, to saucy Nell Gwyn, and to dower her with large revenues and splendid titles, if she would but consent to be his maîtresse in titre. But to all his seductions and bribes, the inflexible maid of honor turned a blind eye. No future, however dazzling, could compensate her for the loss of her dearest possession. I hope, said the king at last, I may live to see you old and willing, as he walked away in high dudgeon. 
to the proposed match with the duke, he point-blank refused his consent, and vowed that if his sovereign will were defied, the punishment would be in proportion to the offense. But the fair Stuart had finally made up her mind. It had long been her ambition, from childhood it is said, to be a duchess, and she was not going to let the opportunity slip for all the kings in the world. What might come after was another matter. A duchess's coronet and a wedding ring were her immediate goal. Thus it came to pass that one dark night she stole away from the palace of Whitehall and was rowed to London Bridge, where the duke awaited her in his coach. Through the night the runaway pair were driven to Cobham Hall in Kent, where long before morning dawned, an obliging parson had made them man and wife. Frances Stuart was a duchess at last, and Charles's long intrigue had ended, or so it seemed, in final discomfiture. On hearing the news, the king was beside himself with anger. He forbade the runaways ever to show their faces near his court. He even dismissed his chancellor, Clarendon, who he suspected of having a hand in the plot. But all his wrath fell impotently on the new duchess, who returned his presence and settled smilingly down to enjoy her new dignities and her honeymoon. Within a year, so powerless is anger against love, Charles summoned the truants back to favor, and the duchess, as lady of the bedchamber to the queen, was installed once more at Whitehall, more splendid and preeminent than ever. During her brief exile, she had held a rival court of her own as near Whitehall as Somerset House, where, says Peppy, she was visited for her beauty's sake by people, as the queen is at night. And they say also she is likely to go to court again and there put my lady Castlemaine's nose out of joint. God knows that would make a turn. How far the Duke's bride succeeded in putting Lady Castlemaine's nose out of joint must remain a matter of speculation. There seems little doubt that as a wife, she proved more complacent to Charles than as a maid. She had carried her virtue unstained to the altar and a duchess's coronet, and this seems to have been the main concern of the beautiful prude that Charles was more infatuated even with the wife than with the maid of honor, is incontestable. He not only made open love to her at court, but especially after he had packed off her husband, the duke, as ambassador to Denmark, his pursuit took a clandestine and more dangerous shape. Pepys throws a light on what looks like a secret amour when he tells us, on the authority of Mr. Pierce, that Charles once did take a pair of oars, or sculler, and all alone, or but one with him, go to Somerset House from Whitehall, and there, the garden door not open, himself clamber over the wall to make a visit to the Duchess, which is a horrid shame. But the Duchess's new reign of conquest was destined to be brief. To the consternation of her royal lover, she was struck down with smallpox, by which, to quote Pepys again, all do conclude that she will be wholly spoiled, which is the greatest instance of the uncertainty of beauty that could be in this age. But then she hath had the benefit of it to be first married, and to have kept it so long, under the greatest temptations in the world from a king, and yet without the least imputation." That Pepys' fears were realized, we know from Rouvigny letters to Louis the Fourteenth, in which he says that her matchless beauty was impaired beyond recognition, one of her brilliant eyes being nearly quenched forever. During this tragic illness, Charles, who is consumed with anxiety, visited her more than once, thus proving at a terrible risk the sincerity of his devotion and it is even said that his admiration of her was not diminished by the loss of her beauty. With this loss of her beauty, however, the Duchess's reign may be said to have come to an end. 
King Charles's eyes were soon to be dazzled by the fresher charms of Louise de Querelle, whom the Sun King had sent from France to turn his head and influence his foreign policy in Louis's favor. And La Belle Stuart was not slow to realize that at last her sun had set. During the remainder of her long life, at least until the Orange King came to the throne, she retained her office of the Lady of the Bedchamber to two queens. But her appearances at court, the scene of so many triumphs, were as few as she could make them. For the rest of her days were spent in retirement among her beloved books and pictures and cats, until, after thirty years of widowhood, full of years and wearied of life's vanities, she was laid to rest in her ducal robes in Westminster Abbey. The bulk of her enormous fortune went to her nephew, Lord Blantyre, with a direction that he should purchase with part of it an estate to be known as Lennox's love to Blantyre. And, to this day, Lennox love perpetuates, like the Britannia of our coins, the memory of one of the most beautiful and tantalizing women who have ever driven men to distraction by their beauty. End of chapter 1